I feel like I wish I would, I knew that, um, like if you're 19 years, it's roses. If it's 20 years, it's bronze. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I, in August I celebrated, it was my 20th anniversary of group with Dr. 20 Rose. years. Yes. 20 years. I, I thought of, when I think about that, I mean, before I started group therapy, I was a member of a 12 step program and I started that when I was 19 years old. And I started group when I was 27 years old and I'm now 48 and I've spent more than half my life in mental health treatment and recovery. So I feel, I feel really proud about that. And when I first started, when I first started in group, and of course the book is about group. When I first started, I went into my first day and there was a woman there who'd been there for 12 years. And I was like, oh my God. I am not doing that. Like I am not doing 12 years of this. Like I'm fast tracking and I'm going to do all my homework and I'm going to take the AP version of this. So it is, it's, it's amazing. Like one part of the character arc is now I'm proud to be 20 years in and still going. So yeah. yeah thank you for asking. I love to wax eloquently about my time. Well, so two follow-up questions on that. One is, Okay, so how does one celebrate one's 20 year anniversary in group therapy? Like, <laughs> is there cake? Is that's, there? <laughs> well, that's very funny. So the, there's a, there, Max, who's a character in the book, he recently celebrated right before the pandemic, which is that recently? What is time? I don't know. But right before the pandemic started, he was going to be celebrating. 30 years, okay, 30 years with Dr. Rosen and group and somebody who's more of a newcomer, actually the guy in the epilogue who's who's had some of the same struggles I had, he was like, we're going to get cake pops. We're going to go to Starbucks before group. We're going to buy oh, all the cake pops and we were going to like come and celebrate, but then the pandemic hit. So there's no, there's no bona fide celebration a lot of people don't remember but max remembers the date he started and i of course remember the date i started so really it's more just like a nod you get an extra like pat on the back and then you know keep doing the work um so that also that raises another question for me um which is given that people stay 20 to 30 years <laughs> <laughs> how do you measure success when you're uh, participating in group therapy, like how do you know that it's working? Yeah, God, that's such a great question. And it's a question that comes up in the group process. And for me, my benchmark for the first five years I was there was, do I have a boyfriend? Are mm -hmm. we having a healthy sexual relationship? And am I happy and am I free? Do I have a voice? And I don't know that I would have articulated it that clearly but what I was searching for is how do I have a voice in my relationships my intimate relationships certainly with men but also with friends and so it was I had a very superficial benchmark right it was a wedding a a trip I mean short of a wedding like I wanted to go to Costco on a Sunday with a boy you know and buy stuff together for our households like so that was very, it was very much like a romantic quest, right? Like I'm a child of America. I live in a world where like a woman is supposed to crave marriage. For me, when I got into group and dug into that desire, what I was really saying is I want to be connected. I want a relationship where I can exhale and let my hair down and have a zit and have bad breath and, and and have a be in a bad mood and still be in the relationship and and tolerate other people's mm. mess or morning breath as it were and so what's interesting now is now i mean i've been married for 13 years i've got two children what what's the what's the goal and now i see myself in a more nebulous place right now I go to therapy, I stay in therapy because I want support to take in the life that I built because of group, right? I don't know how people do their lives. Like I'm parenting almost teenagers. I've got aging ill parents who live mm -hmm. in another state. I've got in-laws, I've got jobs. Like I have all the stuff that everyone my age 
basically has. And I believe that the group supports me, but in terms of measuring it, that's a tricky question that I don't know how to answer other than to say my life just keeps getting better. And when I look at the fact that now I've left law and I write full time, mm -hmm. I do know that I would not have done that, but for a group. Group really held me. They're like, why are you holding on to this job? Why don't you try writing full time? And I batted it away for a year. And then I just had the courage to leap. Right. And it's not the same as being borderline suicidal. Right. Like it's a luxury to go to group and be like, hmm, should I quit my job? I'm in a very different place and I still need support. I view it like the gym. Right. Like I don't stop going to the gym. OK, and that's a good analogy, actually. Yeah. We, so we that's, do continuously. Yeah. So it's like continuous. And I'm I mean, one thing that's been very, very eye opening and heartbreaking to to really come to terms with over these 20 years is just because I go to group and just because, or I, I check in at my 12 step meetings, it, nothing guarantees me a life without pain or disappointment or sorrow. Mm -hmm. I think in the back of my mind, I always thought, well, I'm in recovery. I go to therapy. Like I have force field around me. There you go. So bad things shouldn't happen. And of course they happen. And when they happen, I, I sort of have to recalibrate and realize, oh, those things I put in place help me have a functional response to trauma or life, life on life's terms, as they say in 12 steps rooms. It doesn't mean pain-free life. It means you'll be held in your pain by these various groups that I check in with. Yeah. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question from completely the other end of the book, which is to ask, how did you even start group therapy? Like, why? You, if you were already going to twelve-step meetings, why wasn't that enough? Oh, and that why, was, what led you to start group therapy? Yes, that was one of my very first questions to Dr. Rosen when I was like, "Okay, I need to know why isn't enough? Why isn't enough that I I go to you know? If you want, to, I lived in Chicago. I live in Chicago, and I did in the mm -hmm. book. Like, you can go to a meeting three times a day if you want. Like, you can get all you need." Yep. Why wasn't that working? And I felt this great allegiance to my 12-step program. I kind of felt like I'm cheating on it. And it's very, what I love about the 12-step program that works for me is it's very democratic. There's no one in charge. The money goes to the organization. And it's a, just a meritocracy. I sat in meetings with people who were unhoused or had very or you don't know like you're not supposed to know it's anonymous right so I didn't feel like it wasn't a place for social climbing and it felt like I'm going into this private therapy situation with an authority figure just felt like what this is goes against everything in my grain but what I knew was I had the feeling that I I'd reached a ceiling of how how well I could get and I, I owe so much to the 12-step program that helped me stop binging and purging, but I, I needed more. And I knew a bunch, of, not a bunch, I knew a handful of women and men who had started in the program years before me, and they were probably 10 and 20 years older than I was. Mm -hmm. And they were, they, they had jobs and they were, you know, sober in their addictions, but they didn't have families and they didn't have this fullness of life. And I was so scared. I knew I was that without more intervention, I would be the person who killing it at work, coming home, making mm -hmm. dinner alone, going to a meeting. And I thought I got to find something more. So that's, that opened my eyes. And the summer before I found Dr. Rosen, I had started to sort of I say the word decompensate, but I think that's a, a term of art. I was starting to cry everywhere I went. And I went to, I went to work and I went to meetings and people were like, oh, hey, you want to call my therapist? And I said, no, every single time I can't afford it. I didn't, I was a student. I can't afford therapy. I had bare bones insurance. Like if my head fell off, I could probably get it sewed back on, but I can't go to therapy. Right. So I said, no, no, no. And then a friend of mine you know those moments where you see something in a friend of yours and the, the, the light had gone on inside of her, something I hadn't seen before. And I'd known her for many years from meetings. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, what is it? And she was like, oh, it's my therapist. 
and I roll, right? She was very wealthy. I am, I was not wealthy. And the way that she described it, it just seemed like something tugged at me and made me like take one step forward. Like, I'm going to call this guy and see what he has to say. And that's what happened. But I got there because I saw proof in somebody else who saw him who had a light go on in her eyes. And, you know, when I think back, we had, she, she took me to dinner after a meeting one night. I didn't want to go. We're sitting there and I'm like, what, did you get new lip gloss? What's going on here? And she's like, oh, it's my therapist. He really makes me look at myself. And, you know, she'd had a really tumultuous marriage. She's like, the more work I do on myself, the better our marriage gets. And I was just like, mm. oh, that's really practical. That's, that seems so, and they, I mean, they would have these just giant knockdown fights. And I was like, this guy might be a miracle worker. And I was like, I just want some of that for myself. And, and, oh, this is, how, this is what happened. She said the super magic words, which was, it's cheap. Cause group is one third the cost of individual. You oh, gotta share, okay, right. right. You got to share the circle. You got to share your time. And all I could hear was cheap, which meant I could finagle financially. I could stomach, it was 60 bucks a week at the time I started. I'm pretty sure 60 bucks a week, which was astronomical, but it was, I was able to like imagine it. Whereas other people were like $300 an hour. And I'm like, impossible, right? So once I heard that it was cheap and I saw her and then she said something offhand, she happened to know that Dr. Rosen had just gotten remarried. And she said, he smiles all the time. He's so mm. happy. And just like my heart split open, like remarried. There was something about, it. it wasn't that he got married for the first time. It was that remarried. That all of a sudden I had this whole idea of him. Like he had a bad first marriage and he was heartbroken and he found love again. And I just, I, I made it up, but mm. it was compelling enough that made me, that I called him. And then I just kept taking one step and then one step. And when I met him, he scared me to death. He scared me to death. But I hung in there because he was smart and I could tell he could see me. Like I said two things and he was like, oh, you're, you're an adult child of an alcoholic. And I was like, well, well, yes. And it was just like, he was a couple steps ahead of me. And I thought, oh, this guy could take care of me. And that okay. was really, that overrode my fear. Are you saying that he figured things out about you that you hadn't even told him yet? Like just through the way you kind of yeah. presented? Yes. Yeah. I said one thing about my high school. I think I tossed off something like, yeah, my high school boyfriend smoked a lot of pot. He was like, oh, you love, you are romantically attracted to alcoholics and addicts. Absolutely true. And I knew that about myself, but he knew that from one clue. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> you know, and he made pronouncements too, which now, to be honest with you now, I think in this cultural moment, being a young woman and having a man tell me things about myself, I, I would not like that right now. But at the time, you know, this is pre me too. This, I was so repressed for anybody to see me at all was like a glorious finding. But I think sometimes now, I, I think there's something a little problematic about a man making proclamations about a woman he's seen for like five minutes. So that raises, since you've been in the group for 20 years, how have you noticed Dr. Rosen changing? Oh my gosh. That is a topic of conversation we have in group all the time. Oh, really? People, yeah, like <laughs> literally. So last Friday, last Friday, less than a week ago, something happened. Oh, I know what it was. He was doing a role play, right? Like you come in and you say, oh, I'm having a hard time. He's like, okay, I'll be you and you be your boss, you know? And he was doing a role play and he was really aggressive. Like usually he's like very forthright, stays out of denial, but there's something about him. What it looks like is he's just getting bolder and we're sort of like, is it because he doesn't care? Like he's just, do you reach a certain age where you're sort of like, I got a limited amount of time and he's had some health challenges too. So what, maybe I'm projecting of course, right? But it looks like there's this sort of liberation, like huh. we're all gonna shit or get off the pot here. You either come with me, I'm gonna guide you off the pot or to shit. <laughs> anyway, um, 
And it feels like there's a looseness about, I mean, he seems pretty loose in the book, right? Um, but he's less, and you know what? This is like anybody who's read the book, Dr. Rosen's thing is prescriptions, but not for drugs. The prescriptions are always involved, you, the, right. the group member doing a thing, usually with a group member or with some piece of support, some person, and you go do a thing out in the world meant to, I don't know what, I think he makes it up. I haven't seen an outrageous prescription, like the ones I got in the book, like get a tattoo on your belly or, you know, book, like call a group member before and after you and your boyfriend are intimate. Like there's, I haven't seen that in so long. I kind of miss it to tell you the truth. I wonder if the pandemic is sort of like, you can't really tell people to go out and do things in a right. pandemic. That was part of it. And then I wonder if some of it's just evolution, like, he's older, he's not, I don't, I don't know if he's tame. I can't decide if he's tamer or bolder. You know what I mean? But it's yeah. been a while since something crazy went down where people are like, no, don't take that prescription. <laughs> um, that, so I'm like, got a couple questions here. I'm trying to figure out which one goes most thematically. Um, well, so, so you, you actually have kind of already alluded to this. And this is in the book too, which is which is startling, I think, for some folks who've kind of been socialized in a more kind of conventional boundaried idea of how therapy works, is going into group, you knew a fair amount of personal information about Dr. Rosen. You would actually run into him in 12-step meetings. And as the book goes by, you actually continue to, to know, you know, he's 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 a pretty open book himself. Yeah. Um, how does that affect um the healing process for you as a client? What, what is it about that? Does that work? Does that not work? Does it distract? I think all of the above, to be honest, where, where I sit, it's so interesting because I have talked to lots of therapists and groups of therapists through, through the book, right? Therapists are so uncomfortable with this and lots of patients are too. Like, but I have been hearing, like I, I talked to the psychiatric residents at the University of Pennsylvania and what they were saying, I mean, they're, they're early in their training, right? They were saying that the notion of a therapist as a blank slate, that's sort of a Very fusty mean. kind of like, we're not so into that anymore. Like we're not in analyst chairs or whatever, but there have been group sessions and I wrote about them in the book where like another group mate would know like that Dr. Rosen had some gastrointestinal issues in the eighties. Like that's, very strange to know. And I have very, I have different reaction to that. Part of it is there's a way in which I, I need, I need whoever's helping me to be human, to have a body and to have struggle and not even necessarily, I don't need them to be on the other side of it. Some of my early conversations with Dr. Rosen during group I would like rattle the cage and say, please tell me, have you ever felt like this? Have you ever, and I just, I didn't need him to tell me his romantic resume or how it felt to get divorced, but mm -hmm. I really, and it seemed like he knew that I needed to know that. I mean, like I need, it's not that I could assume it, right? Like every adult person has had a pain. Everyone's had their heart right. broken, right? I needed him to look me in the eye and tell me affirmatively, and he did. And there's times where it's, it is, I mean, it is distracting. It is distracting. Like when someone, someone came, this was years ago now, but someone was like, oh yeah, one time I went to lunch at Dr. Rosen's house and his wife made us sandwiches. And I'm like, in what context right. does, <laughs> right? Fast forward before my, I get married, my fiance, now my husband and I went to dinner at Dr. Rosen's house. So I think that there are the material, I imagine that even Dr. Rosen would say some of the things that have come to pass, maybe they wouldn't happen again. It's hard to call them mistakes because mm -hmm. that's just so diminishing of the work. Right, right. I think the most important ground rule for any of this is, is it speakable in group? If something has, if, if I feel loaded up after hearing about my therapist's bowels, which I do and did and have, can I say that? And can I get support? Is group a place where I can work that out? Because group's the place where it happened. So it's tricky. And I can understand, I get 
emails all the time where people are like, how does that work? Like, why? And I can't tell, I can't tell anyone. I can't even tell myself, how did I get better when, you know, some percentage of my therapy time involved talking about my therapist's divorce. Somebody had a fantasy about bankruptcy or his, you know, like I said, like his, his body breaking down or whatever. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, but somehow I ended up here and that's in the mix, you know? Yeah, it's interesting how he's kind of, he kind of a, the, the, just in the, like the way you've described him, just in this like little talk, you know, he's an interesting mixture of, he definitely comes across as, you know, kind of an authority who has a fair amount of direction, like he takes the group places, um, yeah. and also some humility, like, yeah. you know, like, you know, that he's human, and you know, that he's in a body that doesn't always work the way he wants it to, like, like all of us. Yeah, yeah, we're currently right now, we're, you know, Chicago, Chicago's pandemic status is we really could go back in person and we, we, we've been back in person and then we go back on zoom, like when a, when Mm -hmm. a variant surges and then we go back and, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth depending on what's happening, you know, health, we've got a lot of, we have some older group mates and then we've got people who live with vulnerable people. So we have to take care of everybody, but right now we really could be, we really could all things being equal, the numbers in Chicago and we're not, and it's because of a, a health issue with Dr. Rosen. And mm. I, I have very mixed feelings about that, but, and I take them to group and I talk about them. And it's like, one thing about being a long-term therapy patient is he's watching me age and I'm watching him age and he's 20 years older. And it's sort of mm. like, we're having conversations about longevity and mm. anticipatory grief and, you know, limited amount of time like it's just it's yeah. sort of in my face because of group right now yeah so you've alluded to like having gone back and forth between <clears throat> real-time therapy group therapy and being online can you talk a little bit about what does it feel like what do you gain and what do you lose when you're online with your group members yeah I have very strong feelings about this and they've gotten stronger as this has gone on And when we first went online almost two years ago, right? Like it was like March 17th of 2020, I was so grateful that it was possible to still meet. And I would go down to my basement and I'd hook up my computer and there was no heat and I'd be wearing like a hoodie and I'd be like, hi everybody. And I was just like, I just like could almost touch them, right? And it was such a lifesaver. And then like everyone, Zoom got old, right? And what really messed me up was having the opportunity. We've had two stints now where we've gone back in person. And I re- it's like all of a sudden, like if you've been eating ramen noodles nonstop and all of a sudden, sudden someone hands you salmon with, I, I don't know, I must be hungry, salmon with rice and you just get a totally different thing. It's like, oh, now I see the nutrients I'm missing. And how I would say it is being on Zoom is like when you go to a hotel and you work out in the hotel gym, which is really a room, <laughs> a suite with a couple of right. treadmills in it. And you're like, you're used to being at home and you run on the lake or your path around your neighborhood and it's beautiful in the fresh air and a hotel workout, it gets the job done, but it is not the same. Yeah. And when, when we went back in person, there were several things I realized that really drop out on Zoom and one of them is the casual, the casual encounters that happen in the waiting room yeah. or most, most acutely when it's time to leave and we all sort of like we hug and then we walk together. So if I've, if I've been rattled during the session or overstimulated or flooded even, mm-hmm. somebody just, they, they, they hold me and they take me and they're like, come with me. And I get to do that for other people too. I'm, I'm not the only hot mess, you know? Um, and I really miss that comfort and care. And another part is having my people, my witnesses and group see my body is really important to me as somebody who has pretty, pretty severe body dysmorphia and an eating disorder and the pandemic Mm -hmm. and like my body's Mm -hmm. changed and their bodies have changed. Like it's, it had been very scary to like not be seen. Yeah. And there's something about being seen is just helps me stay kind of straight. Right. Right. The last last thing I'll say is like last Friday, 
when we had croup, things got very heated. And it's just like an old, old issue of mine. Something that's come up post group, the book is like my intense jealousy of other women. It's a super attractive quality I have, but it, it, it just, it gets, it gets ignited in me and I have a really hard time. And there's a woman I have a lot of conflict within group and it just, it's both of us have sister issues and we just like, and it got really heated and we were both worked up and I'm screaming at my computer, like, fuck you. <laughs> I was like, I just like, I haven't done a lot of yelling over Zoom. First of all, my husband works from home. Sometimes mm -hmm. my kids are home. It's not that productive. And I got off the Zoom so rattled. And my husband's like outside the door, like, do you need a hug, honey? And I just felt like I, it's just not the same. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like telling Dr. Rosen, like if I'm, if I'm going to do the deep work, if I'm going to really heal this, this splinter, the soul, the soul marring I have from my relationship with my sister, with this mm -hmm. other group mate, I can't go that deep when I'm by myself in a room. We can do it. I mean, I'm happy to do chip away at it a little bit, but we're not going to be able to make huge strides when I'm alone. I just, it's too hard. So yeah, yeah. I'm glad it's there, but it's not the same. You mentioned being seen when you're in the, <clears throat> being seen when you're in person with each other and you can see each other's full bodies, but there's a different kind of being seen when you're in a Zoom meeting, yes. right? And so I'm actually kind of curious, like, what have you learned about people because you're seeing them in their homes with their cats and their kids and yes. their spouses and their, I don't know, if people drink or, you know, like yeah. people do all kinds of weird things in their Zoom therapy. It, it is fascinating. That is such a good point because you do get so much data. And it, mm -hmm. the first time it happened, I realized, oh, this is super important, even though it's not my, nobody's preference, right? Um, mm -hmm. But there's a member of my group whose spouse is suffering from dementia and she'd come and tell the stories, right? And we were super sympathetic. It sounds mm -hmm. so, so difficult. But one time during group, she's sitting there on her computer and he storms in and is like towering over her. And he's like, not in his right mind. And yeah. we saw her deal with it. And it's like all of a sudden, like, yep, yep, this yep. is so real. This is so real. And that I think we all, there was something about seeing that we were better able to help her. We understood, oh, this is a crisis. Like this is not an inconvenience or like a huge bummer. This is actually a crisis and are you safe? And that mm -hmm. was huge information. And then some people, there's <laughs> one, you know, you just, you're right. You see the craziest things. I know you're a therapist and I would, I would love for you to tell stories about it, but um, like one time we're sitting there and you see someone's, someone who has a lot of resources, way more than I do. You see this hand like come and set, set something down. And then this person is eating the most delicious looking pasta. I mean, it was like glistening. And we're like, what just happened? She's like, oh, my assistant cooked for me. My and we're all like, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. I see how that is. And so one of our, we, we meet twice a week and one morning, like it's early, right? And I'm an early riser. So I'm up and I'm like chirpy, chirpy, ready to roll. But some people are like rolling out of bed mm -hmm. and one group member had their camera off and everyone's like, like, I get it. If you're getting dressed, yes, have your camera off. But it had been like 10 minutes. We're like, are you dressed? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm doing all my morning routine. And Dr. Rosen was like, well, I'd like you to invite, I'd like to invite you to turn your camera on. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way and she, I mean, she was dressed and she totally did. And so we're just watching her. She's like, this is her makeup and her deodorant. And she blow dries her hair. And yeah. I was like, this was, and that was so intimate. It was yeah. so, and I wouldn't, I'm not showing anyone my, you know, my, you know, CVS op, mascara and my lip gloss. that's like 12 years old. I, it was what was interesting. Then we all got to affirm her because she's a very private person and she let six people get in there. And it was, it is amazing that intimacy and growth can happen in any context. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked that because I've been so down on the Zoom situation, but you're right. Really interesting things happen. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting being a therapist myself. 
Um, one of the biggest adjustments I had to make when I started seeing people in this kind of environment is I realized you can't assume people are in a confidential or private environment. Like I would be having a conversation with people and various cues would it alert me to the fact that, oh, they're not alone in the room. Yeah. Or, you know, kids would come rushing in or, you know, and so like I actually had to sort of train myself to ask, are you in a confidential place? And so I'm kind of curious with that in mind, how important is confidentiality to the group? Like, how does it figure? Because that's another one of those, I, I think when people read, read, read the book, um, there's a little bit of a different take on confidentiality and how it operates. Totally, totally. And what, is, what I came to understand was very unorthodox about Dr. Rosen is he's the doctor, he's a psychiatrist, he's bound by all the ethics. He can't say anything about any of us out without us without our permission or whatever but he does not impose confidentiality on the on the group mates and I, having never been in group before I was like okay I guess that's how we roll let's do it what I learned later was many 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 therapists when you join a group yeah they have you sign a contract that says I will not discuss the context, the contents of group outside of this group. I will also not have contact with group mates outside of the group. That, as I understand it, is, is I don't know if it's standard operating procedure, standard. but it's definitely the norm, right? Mm -hmm. And Dr. Rosen didn't do either of those. And when I first learned about it, I was like, I mean, I understood, I'm like, once I know the rules in a, in a situation, I'm like, great, I'll follow the rules perfectly. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, wait a minute, that means that anyone sitting here can say stuff about me and say my name and say, well, this is what Christy talked about in therapy. That's horrifying. That's not safe. That does not feel safe. And I pressed Dr. Rosen about that. And he was like, how do you know that makes you not safe? And I was like, uh, because if Brad goes to his job and tells his boss what kind of grief and what kind of sex I'm having, uncool. Maybe I want a job there someday. And Dr. Rosen's point was twofold. But the, the main point was us all being addicts and my eating disorder qualified me as an addict in his world mm -hmm. and in mine too. We've all been trained in our family and in our culture to keep so many secrets and to not tell not tell not tell and that not telling almost killed me with bulimia and it kept me so isolated that he just as i understand it he doesn't believe that it is helpful to addicts to their getting well mm -hmm. to impose more don't tell, don't tell on them because mm. secrets, shame. I mean, addiction is based in shame. I mean, I shouldn't tell you this, you're the therapist, but this is how the lay patient understands it. Addiction fosters like festers in shame and in yeah. secrecy. And so right. he didn't want to participate in that. What I have learned is that we're kind of all in the same boat, right? Like I don't want my business out there. I mean, we can talk about the fact that I wrote a book about the whole thing, but um, I don't want my red like if I go in and talk about something that's going on with my children I do not want that good leaving and mm -hmm. I don't want here's the other thing that seems benign but I but like let's say Brad and my group I am in there talking about something something sensitive going on with my kids Brad may not tell his boss but he may tell someone who's in the Rosen world but not in my group who I'm friendly with then that person calls me I'm like I heard about that thing with your kid. I don't want that to happen. And mm. um, it, it, I have not had that experience in many, okay. many years. So that's good. But you are like, as a group mate, I'm developing my own ethics. I'm asking for what I want from the group. I can say whatever I need to say. And what I found for myself is if Brad comes in with a hot button issue, it's not hot for me because it's not my issue. I don't need to talk about it. Things that upset me or, or become hot and shameful inside of me, I definitely need to talk about. I definitely need to talk about them. The best place to do that is in group. So I think I trust my group mates now and I understand people's hesitation when they, when they hear about this aspect of this group. People who are interested in group therapy should know that the norm is 
people can't talk about what happens in the group outside of the group. So right. that's, that's a norm. And Dr. Rosen is just outside of that norm. It's just a different style, I think. I mean, I don't think it's, a, it's there's a right and a wrong way. I think it's just a different style a way. And you, and you gave a good explanation, actually, about why it's important with this particular group of people that there not be another strict boundary, you know, around sharing, you know, something that's personal. Um, how... So actually, here's the one fault. I have two questions. They're, they're wrestling in my mind. But the first one is how, so could you share something personal in your group and ask your group members not to share it? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, so I've never done that, probably because I'm, I'm not sure why that is. But, but other group mates do that. Like someone the other day, we, <laughs> she was talking about her something going on financially. And we were like, like she was getting a settlement, a legal settlement. And we're like, well, how much? And she was dancing around it, did not want to tell us. And so the minute we smell hesitation and secret, we're like, oh, no, 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 no. You, you have to tell us. Like, what, what is it? What is it? You know, and she absolutely, first of all, she didn't have to tell us. You were allowed right, to have right. whatever boundaries you need. She ended up telling us, she told us, and she said, can, can this please not leave this room? If you need to talk about it, can you call me? Or can we talk about it again in group? But can yeah. you just, this? And I immediately felt like, who would need to talk about that? Yeah, and, yeah. And I, I obviously have a very like I've taken really to heart this notion of no secrets, um, no secrets from my group. And later on that night, I was laying in bed and I kind of, I kind of wanted to tell my husband like, and I could not remember the number. Like I, I, oh. I have an awesome memory. I have an amazing memory and it like literally just boop out of my head. And I was laughing and I was like, I don't need to tell my husband that I don't need to tell him that. And she asked, and I, it's not like I was keeping a secret from my husband. Mm -hmm. First of all, it literally flew away. And secondly, honoring that relationship felt really important in the moment anyway. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even say there's a number and I forgot it. I was like, why do I need to have pillow talk about her settlement with my husband? Like mm -hmm. I got to have a process of discernment about it, which is I think what other people do. Yeah, yeah. So that raises the question, how has the book affected your relationship with your group members? <laughs> wow, it's been, it's been a, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster. I told them the day I started working on it because I had originally written a novel. It was horrible, horrible, unreadable novel about a young, lonely woman and her therapist. And I didn't know how to end the book because I don't know anything about fiction and writing fiction. So I just had the therapist and the girl protagonist just have sex. That was my in the end, you know. So I'm I'm describing this in group, and Dr. Rose was like, "Bring in that sex scene." And I brought it in and it, he, he was like, give it to Brad. And Brad reads it out loud. It, it was only like two pages. It was it's like a writer's so, nightmare. I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, thank you. And I didn't even know enough to know that I should like guard my work. Like this is how much of a baby I was. I was kind of like, yeah, I wrote a, I wrote a sex scene. Hmm. And Brad is reading it and I'm hearing like how terrible it is. And also the group mates are groaning because they're picturing me and Dr. Rosen because it's kind of written that way. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, uh, as soon as it was, Brad was done. I was like, I'm never writing another thing as long as I live. Like that was horrible. Mm -hmm. You have scarred me. F all of you. And then Max said to me, why don't you just write the true story? Like you obviously want to write about your relationship with your therapist. And so I said, okay. And that sort of sunk into me. And so I started writing the true story that became group. And I told my group all along and I sent them drafts that they did not read, which is fine, but I wanted them to know. And there were lots of feelings about it. Like one group mate who's very private was like, don't write about me ever. And I said, okay. And she's not in the book. I know where she belongs. I know where she gave me like steps to step on, but um, she's not in the book. And Brad, when I got an agent, so it was looking when the commercial parts of this were happening and it looked like this was going to be a book in the world. Mm -hmm. Brad came in one day really mad and he's like screaming at Dr. Rose and he's like, Christy is exploiting us and you're letting her, you should have never let her read this book. This is unfair, unethical. And I am like, oh my God, is he right? I'm freaking mm -hmm. out. 
I do not want to betray my group. I, yeah. Nothing was worth it. But also like, I'm going to have to get a book deal, dude. Like, what, what do I do now? And Dr. Mm-hmm. Rosa looks at me and he's like, just breathe, just breathe. I was like, okay. And then I turned to Brad and I said, listen, I will let you read. What if I give you my most updated manuscript? You can read it. If there's something that you want to come out, I will take it out. And I, I gave it to him and over, he read it over the weekend and he came back and he was like, okay, I, this book is awesome. And it's going to help a lot of people. And he turns to me kind of mad. And he was like, I should have been in it more. Like I really helped you way more than you said. (laughs) I was like, wait, you were just mad that I did this in the first place. And I was really careful. I did one full draft Mm -hmm. where I just took out anything that didn't belong to me. Anything about why Brad Readers don't need to know why Brad came to group. That's not, that's Brad's book. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, I was ready to do, I called it my ethical revision. I was ready to take it all out, but it was late in the process. It was like four years into drafting because they're interesting people and they had cool kinky problems. And I wanted them in there at the beginning because they're more alluring than like sad white girl can't get a boyfriend, but Mm -hmm. I just knew it had to come out. And I'm really grateful that I understood along the way, other memoirists, Lydia Yutnovich, Melissa Fibos, they really told me how to, they gave me some guidance on how to handle it. And I still have to see these people, so I cannot betray them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are they, are, are, are your group members glad that the book is in the world? That's so interesting. You know, there's a split. The people who are in my group today who Mm -hmm. came after group, so they're not in the book. Okay. I think it's the bee's knees. They think it's so awesome. Christy plays big. Christy, Christy let herself use her voice and take it on this huge stage. And it was, you know, it was given the seal of approval by Reese Witherspoon. And the argument is like the old time, like the Max, Patrice, the people who are in the book are like, that's easy for you to say, you are not in it. Uh-huh. Um, which is just, it seems like a good natured sort of like toggle, but there's something in there. I, I would say overall, I think that they're glad. We all believe in group and we all think it works. And it's, I'm not the only life that's been transformed. Mm-hmm. I do think it's a little tricky there. Let me put it this way. Everybody's super glad I am not writing about group for my next book. <laughs> <laughs> What does, um, what does Rosen think of the book? What did he think of the book? Yeah, that's a good question because he's somewhat inscrutable and it's easy in my relationship with him. It's easy for me to project all kinds of things. Uh-huh. And right before the book came out, somebody said to me, we were on Zoom and Patrice nudged me. She said, why don't you ask Dr. Rosen how he feels about the book? And I was like, oh, I said, okay, Dr. Mm-hmm. Rosen, how do you feel about the book? And he was like, you know, he's like beaming and he's like, oh, I'm so glad you asked. I feel proud, happy and grateful. And I was like, and I was just like tearing up because I think I assumed that, but there is something special about hearing it affirmed. And I had my witnesses and I I hold that as a treasured memory. Like I'm not, I don't have to wonder he told me point blank. Um, circling back to something we were talking about earlier, when we were talking about like, why does group therapy work? And one of the things I, I, I wanted to ask you about, I didn't know if in your own life experience, you had experiences in like individual psychotherapy to con, like, how do you see the difference between the two? Is one more potent than the other? Is it just that it works for you and not, you know? Yeah, I really think that for me, I I know people who have the most intense, glorious relationships with their individual therapists. So I've seen that for me, I have some, I would say character defects that that kept that from being a good mode for me. Number one is I want to people please. So I had some individual therapy and I wasn't like consciously trying to take care of my therapist, but I was performing. I wanted to tell good stories. I wanted to act like I was making progress. 
I wanted to act like I was more willing to change than I actually was. Cause I think mm. that's what a therapist wants. They want to see you open and, you know, I'll do anything. And I was giving so much lip service. Now I never stuck with it with anyone more than like eight sessions, which now mm. I know is like nothing <laughs> in my life of therapy. Um, the other thing, when I think back to some of the work I did, the really deep, like when I really, for the first time, touched my white hot rage that had been buried way down in my ankles and it just came bubbling up and out and I was really, really expressing that. I cannot picture being willing to do that alone with a therapist. I really, first of all, in group, I saw other people do it before me, which I didn't write about that because that's their story, but I'd seen other people essentially have a tantrum and I knew I knew it was okay. I knew it was a thing that you could do. So that helped. And then I just think if I was alone with Dr. Rosen and screaming and writhing on the floor, I would feel so embarrassed. And in group, I, I was able to get to some place inside of me where I wasn't self-conscious. I was just all feeling. And mm -hmm. I think I, I have no reason to believe that couldn't have happened in yeah. individual. It's just hard to picture because of all my, you know. It just was, it was a thing for you based on your particular experiences in the world. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, just, I just had this thought as you were talking because I was just, I just finished reading Red Comet, the book about Sylvia Plath. Have you read that? No, I love well, Sylvia just, Plath. It's very cool to contrast what you accomplish in group with some of what we learn about her life. Cause you know, she was in treatment her whole life, you know, trying to get to some kind of better place and really getting like very poor treatment. Like they, yeah. what people knew in the sixties about really serious depression was not a lot, you yeah. know, a lot of malpractice and stuff like that. So it was really cool to read a story about a young woman who's struggling with really serious issues in the world and gets good help. Yeah, you know, and, and and actually comes out at the end of the story, like kind of in this triumphant, empowered place. It, it's such a contrast to kind of women who are coming of the coming of age in like the 60s and 70s, like the Sylvia Plath, yeah. um, which are such tragic. You know, it, it's such a tragic read um, because you realize yeah. so much of her life was uh, was uh, the product of malpractice. Oh, that just hurts my heart. I think Anne Sexton, too. And her therapist, I think, published the notes of yeah. So yeah. I'm like, I remember reading that thinking, like, okay, all y'all Rosen haters, won't you check out this dude? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, I wonder, do are there people who are listening in? I can't really tell, but I don't know if there are people who are listening in who have questions for you. I don't want to monopolize all the question asking. Oh, I have a um I, I can see in the chat somebody has asked. In the, in the book, you're sometimes ambivalent about this style of group. Would you recommend it to other people? And Wayne, how do you feel about it? Oh my God, that's such a good question. I do want to hear what Wayne has to say. You know what? I don't recommend, I recommend group as a modality. I do not press Dr. Rosen. I think you have, I think a patient should have to come, should be interested and intrigued and ask me about it. I just, it's, it's kind of brutal. It's kind of rough, you know? So I, I always say group, but I very rarely try to send people to Dr. Rosen, but I would love to hear what you have to say, Wayne. Well, you know, I actually found myself when I read the book, I actually wanted to be in one of Rosen's group. I, I, I thought that, cause it sounded really challenging. It sounded, there was no easy way out. And I think especially when therapists get into their own therapy, we so much know the things you're supposed to say. We, 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 we are so intellectualized that we can get away with just about every, anything. And it didn't sound like you could get away with anything no. in that group. And so that is actually, so I actually found myself like if I was in Chicago, I would be trying to figure out who is this Dr. Rosen and where oh, is I would, I would give you the number. <laughs> um, but I also know that, um, I also know that I've done lots of different group therapies myself and they're, they all have something. And, and maybe it's just a matter of figuring out, like I've been in a group, I was in a group, they're called T groups and they're Tavistocky and they're very psychoanalytic, right? It's a very different model. And the therapist is the blank slate. He comes into the room and he doesn't say much of anything for sometimes for like a whole hour. 
which if, if and nothing leads to panic and anxiety quicker in a room full of people than the leader of the group refusing to say anything right but but there's actually there's a method to the madness and and i was in that group that was a group that lasted it was an eight hour marathon group and i learned a lot about myself I, I learned and, and at, 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 at the cost of tremendous pain and regression, but I learned a lot about myself. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I add, and I would never do it again. I would, I did it once, never have to do it again. Um, that is so interesting. Um, well, I think there are lots of different, lots of different styles that, that can lead to productive places. Yeah, I totally agree. I saw uh, something in the chat. I probably should have said this earlier. The question was what made me initially go to group therapy? I think I mostly covered it, but one other, like the, what, what really sent me crashing down was I had, I had found out that I was first in my law school class, which mm -hmm. is cause for celebration, except I had picked law as a consolation prize for like my sort of the paucity of relationships in my life. I was like, well, I'm just going to go to law school and get, make a bunch of money. So nobody will know that I have no close friends, no intimacies, no boyfriend, and I'm a disaster in personal relationships, but I'm going to have awesome purses and I'm going to be a baller. And when I got my class rank, I was like, oh no, oh no, this is all I'm ever going to have. And it, it sort of like sparked like the crisis. And I started feeling suicidal. I had suicidal ideations and I was like starting to wish to die. And it was so confusing that my outside life didn't match my inside life and it scared me. And that's when, when my friend mentioned group, I thought, okay, I think I can afford that. And what I thought, I remember walking to Dr. Rosen's office the first time I thought, okay, well, I'll do whatever this dude does, groups, whatever. I'll do this for, until I graduate from law school. And when I get a big job and I make bank, I'm gonna go get real therapy. Like I'm just, I just need him to stop the bleeding, keep me alive until I graduate and make more money. And then I'm gonna go get a real therapist. So I'm gonna be by myself in a plush office and I'll have great insurance. Mm -hmm. And like that just never happened. So <laughs> here we are. You have a, I, can you see the question from Celia? Um, fascinated by the prescriptions and wants to know, did they last indefinitely or do you get to move on to other prescriptions? <laughs> That's a good question. Some of them are just like one-offs, you know, like go get a tattoo, a henna tattoo. But you know, there's some of them I revisit over and over again. My very first prescription mm -hmm. right. was to turn my food over to a group mate and um, we're no longer a group anymore. We're still friendly, but every now and then, and I did that for four years. I think we both mm -hmm. did it to each other for almost four years. And then after that was more sporadic. But sometimes when I feel like I'm just feeling like off with my food or just like feeling like I want to control it, not that I think I would end up binging or purging, God forbid, but just fragile. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll pick that up again and I'll, I'll ask someone who I know from Rosen World, I'll say, can I just send you my food like at the end of the day? And every, like, this will tell you all you need to know. Every time I travel home to see family, I, I turn my food over to other people because I'm like, that's kind of ground zero mm -hmm. for this thing. And I just don't want to go it alone. So prescriptions can come and go and come back. So I guess that's good. Yeah, there was another question there. Uh, I don't know if you want to answer this one, but what do you have any current prescriptions? Oh, that's a good one. You know, here's the kind, the, the, the current prescription I get all the time is I'll come in hot, mad at my husband. Um, you know, it's the pandemic, guys. We're on top of each other. We hadn't been going anywhere. We both work from home. The kids are around. Like every marriage, it's been extremely mm -hmm. stressful, extremely stressful. And there was something that I was really like, and it's suddenly everything, every zone belongs to everybody, you know, whereas before it'd be like, I handle, I handle the social stuff for the kids and he does the math or whatever, not to be sexist, but like, we just had our zones. And then all of a sudden the zones are just mixed up and right. goulash, we became goulash. And I'd come into group just so hot. Like, can you believe what John did? He is such a, you know what? He told the kids, blah, blah, blah. Like, and I'm always mad. And it's always like, I have a prescription. I'm like, oh God. He's like, um, within the next two days, I would like for you to be sexual with your husband and thank him for all that he does for you. And I'm like, what? Like, whoa, no, absolutely not. Some of the theory being, I have a tendency to be 
deprivational around physical touch. And that always makes me extra crispy around in my relationship with my husband. And so, and I always fight it. I'm like, God, Dr. Rosen, that's not what's happening here. I'm like, mm, kind of is, kind of is. When I get into a place where I'm starving, he can't, my husband can't do anything right. And it, it doesn't mean you want to be with him. And it's nice to have the push. Like, oh, remember, Christy, when you get some of your physical needs met, you're not furious about how he guided your daughter through an algebra lesson. So nothing, nothing great to write home about, but just stuff like mundane things in yeah. my relationship with my husband. He's like, I'm supporting your sexuality. Remember you came here and you were very sad that you were never having sex. I'm like, yeah, I remember that. But now I'm a middle-aged woman with two kids and a pandemic. <laughs> He's like, uh, well, do your prescription. <laughs> That's right. Has he ever, uh, has he ever been wrong? That's a good question. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, I've had him make amends to me and okay. yeah, which is a really, it's a very profound thing. Mm -hmm. We had, um, the best example. It was, it was about a year ago. One of the things that happened with group, it was kind of like, oh boy, we didn't foresee this, which is a film company wanted to buy the rights to make a film, right? It's how it's Reese Witherspoon's company, Hello Sunshine. And I'm like, this is beyond my wildest dreams as a writer. Like I never saw this coming. And Dr. Rosen had some reservations and I was just in La La Land. I'm like, I'm going to Hollywood. See ya, see ya Rosen. And he was like, let's slow down here. Like, what does this mean? What if they take liberties? What if they show us, you know, what if they show me transgressing? What if they show us having sex? I'm like, I don't care. It's Reese Witherspoon. She can do whatever she wants. Like it was very cavalier. And Dr. Rosen was like, slow down slow down, be in your body. Let's really talk about this instead of flying off to Hollywood. And I was really mad. And one of the things that Hello Sunshine wanted was like a, a release from Dr. Rosen. And that got very complicated very quickly because of all kinds of things. Yeah. And I was very upset about it and he was upset. And then at the end, when we got, we got to a resolution where everybody was taken care of, but he made amends to me. He's like, I'm, I, I am sorry that the way that I can, like, I didn't like how he handled it. He didn't like how, I, like, I don't know how he did or didn't like how I handled it, but he said to me, I'd like to make an amends. I'm sorry for how I handled some parts of the negotiation. And I had the feeling that he didn't have my back. And then once he made amends, I was like, how did we know? We don't, where do they tell you in therapy school, Wayne, how to handle it when this comes up, when the patient writes the book and then there's going to be a film deal, like not, we, just, not we been were uncharted. Written, yeah, yeah, that one has not been written yet. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, it's a very, it's a very, you know what, you know what I love about that? First of all, I like him being human. It also models for me how to parent. So that I know I can tell, I don't have to be anything yep. for my kids except for willing to own my part, even as a parent. And it's yeah. been, it's been in a really important part of my therapy, actually. So Betty just wrote in asking about your next book. What's that going to be about? Oh my gosh, Betty. Well, my next book is called BFF and it's about female friendship. And it, it there was one particular friendship in my life that came sort of like, blossomed in my life as soon as I got married you know you can tell from group and if you haven't read group the summation is I had a really hard time getting myself straight romantically for lots of reasons and I was really focused on it for a really long time so then when I got married I was like huh, huh, okay I'm just gonna cruise through my life doing my job and whatever and what I discovered very shortly I mean even at, at engagement I discovered oh I have a lot of mess in my female friendship, I have a lot. I had as much work to do there as I did with men, and I did not know that. And so this book is sort of about, and it it, it was work I it, I did in different places. I did it in friendships and in community with other women, and it was really painful. It was a little bit quieter than what I did in group, but it was just as deep, and there was just as much to excavate. So BFF is the story of how I learned how to be a friend at the ripe age of. 40. And just to clarify, uh, is Dr. Rosen a character in BFF? No, he's not. Oh, in really? 
There's one scene. There is one scene. <laughs> I, I I just said my therapist because I really just I need I need him to be in the background. Do you know what I mean? Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, are, are you are you? Are your group members going to have reactions to the fact that they're not in this book? Well, they they asked me because I saw the book and I'm working with the editor now. And so it's like it's in the assembly line of, of mm -hmm. moving forward. And they were like, oh, yeah, well, we, we're there's no group in the book. And I was like, well, there's one scene. And everyone's like, oh, no, there is. But it really is just something that happened to me when I was in group. And so right, it's right, not right. it's not even about group dynamics. But um, they were a little bit like, really, Christy, really? I'm like, well, it's an important scene, but there's only one. <laughs> so, um, well, do we have any other questions from the, uh, I don't even know how many people are watching this. I can't tell. Yeah, I think we hit everything, didn't we? We may have. Anybody else? Wayne, thank you so much for your engagement and for- Yeah, thanks for the conversation. I really, I, can I ask, like for closing out, can, can I ask you a question? Who's the type of patient that you would recommend a group to? The type of patient I would recommend a group to? I recommend group often to a lot of men. Oh. Um, and, and in fact, I am always on the lookout for groups that are actually gender specific. They're all men groups mm. uh, because men have so many things they have to unlearn about how they connect with each other in order to become uh, fuller human beings, you know, and it's, it's, it's a huge challenge for men to, many men to allow themselves to be emotional, to be vulnerable, to rely on other men, you know, um, and so I'm always, I'm always recommending to my um, male clients that they think about getting into a men's group um, specifically. Oh, wow. because the, and, and the reason too, because it has to be a men's group, this is kind of weird, but it's true. I've been in men's groups too. And I know that this it, is that if it's a mixed gender group, many men, especially heterosexual men will defer to women to do the emotional work of the group. <clears throat> they oh. will, they will not, it, it's, it's much less risky to be in a mixed gender group for men, for a lot of men than it is. It, it's sometimes the scariest thing is to be in a group of just men and to work through all your competitive hierarchical tribal stuff um, to that place where you can be truly connected. So though, so that's actually, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm so glad I asked that whole answer just gave me chills, like unlearning toxic ways of being for, for men in groups like yeah. that. And actually that actually really tracks my experience, the heterosexual men, they are, they are not leaders in the way the women are the leaders in my, I'm in a mixed group, but yep. the women really lead. And I would say the heterosexual men are reluctant to, to go to the places. And we're already down there like, come on, the water's warm. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. 